New York and on the new Hot 97 app. Ebro in the morning on Hot 97. Stephen A. Smith, ladies and gentlemen, yeah. give it up. What up, what up, what up? How y'all doing? We are phenomenal this morning. How are you? I'm, 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 it's been a long time, bro. It's been a long Good to see you, man. Good to see you. I'm still here, yeah, man. That's right. You're still here, still doing it. Yeah, you know, sure. my man Peter with you as well. I hear you. Ebro, yeah. t- you know, Ebro takes credit for, for putting your whole you on career. the radio for your the first whole career. time. He says he puts you on the box for the listen, first time. Listen, listen. I ain't going to deny that. I ain't going to deny that. Especially, <laughs> and not only that, he did it when I was unemployed. Wait, so <laughs> so it, the love is always here for Ebro, man. It was Come the on very now. first time you were on the air with Ebro? No. no. I, with him. With him. I've been on the air, on the air before, but you know it, it started skyrocketing when I hung out with my man. It was Stephen mm-hmm. A. and Miss Jones would argue over relationships. It well, she ar- tried to argue, you know, and and, <laughs> and 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 she she didn't realize I was raised by five women, so I kind of know a little something something about that. And you know, she tried to come from left field. You know, I got love for her, but she tried to come from left <laughs> field and I had to bring her back in the straight and narrow. Now when know? now. I, I first reached out to you. You was uh, writing in Philly. You was in yeah. Philly. You was doing spots for ESPN on yep. for the NBA. Yep. And um, I reached out and I was like, "Yo, bro, let's let's work." Right. When did you actually get the bug though? And you were like, "Yo, I'm gonna lean on into this radio thing, and I love it." Well, in, in, in 2005, uh, the general manager for ESPN New York, Tim McCarthy, what up, Tim? Ro- rolled up on me in the bathroom. Uh, ESPN Zone when it was on 42nd Street. Yeah. Yes. And I, I mean, I was like, yo, who are you, man? I'm, I'm, I'm taking the lead. What you doing? And, you know, he was like, hey, sorry, sorry, sorry. I'll uh, wait, I'll wait, wait. And in the bathroom, by the bathroom sink, after I was at signed a deal to do, quite frankly, on my own show on ESPN2, which was on from 2005 to 2007, Tim McCarthy's like, you doing radio, man. You added radio. He said, you're a natural talent. I got to have you. I got to wow. have you. Wow. And Mark Shapiro, who was running ESPN at the time, who's now the president of the Endeavor Agency, and he represents me now, he was like, you want to do this? Because this is in my way. I got plans for you. You really want to do this? I said, it's right across the street. It's two hours right. talking sports. I can do that in my sleep. And, and keep it and, real. And, and, radio and, and, gives you some well, latitude well, 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 to well, flex. But I didn't realize it at that moment. Right. That was the difference. The fact is that you hit that realization. You get on that mic, you know, it's like, wait a minute, I got, I got, I got to talk for the next fifteen minutes. There ain't no commercials. And you no, don't I have don't, a co-host that's, that's right. anymore. No, I, you well, did it. You well, had Ryan it, Rucco for a little while. Ryan Rucco is my little brother. I got mad love for him. Always loved him. But I, I've always been somebody that likes to be solo because, especially when you're doing a debate show like First Take, you know, you got to share the wealth to some degree. Radio is mine. Yeah. You know, it's my show, you know, and make no mistake about it. I say what I want. I do what I want. And that's the way it goes. And I ain't got to worry about anybody else speaking <laughs> unless I want them to speak. So I literally no, dominate the airways from the two hours. No, we hear. We, we hear you. That's right. I'm like, look, he's in there by himself that's in right. a zone. That's right. And it's also cathar- cathartic for you, I'm sure. Yeah, like- no question about it, because there's a lot of things that you want to touch on. But you can't elaborate on as extensively as you might want to. You don't get to dictate the angles or whatever. For me personally, with radio, what makes it easy is my newspaper background. Because every day you had to wake up and your responsibility was to write something compelling that you believe the audience will want to read about. Well, you transition that to television and radio. Excuse me, what about, it's not about you. It's about what you know people people want to hear, what they want to talk about. Now, they might want my perspective, but they dictate the topic. They're the ones that are telling you, this is what we're interested in hearing about. This is what's on our mind. This is what we want to hear about. And that's when your personality has to come in and shine. And radio obviously gave me the format to really, really shine. And your people forget that you're an actual journalist. Yeah. Like, you're not just up here breathing hot air every day and, and right. blowing smoke and stomping your feet and clapping your hands. I've like been a journalist for 25 years. Right. But the thing about it is is that you do elevate to a point where you become a personality. And so the difference is is that, like, back in the day, like, people will tease me sometimes because I get my NBA Finals predictions wrong. That's because I get emotional. I get caught up emotionally. I'd be like, I'm rooting for this team right here. You know, I, I want to see this, and I get emotional. But back in the day, I was never wrong. The reason why is because I was on the scene. So mm. I was caught Side. So if a cat was smoking some weed, or if a cat got in an argument with over with another teammate over his girl, or something like, I knew all of that coming into the game. So I knew who to pick and who not to pick. Mm. Now you're on the air so much because I'm in studio so often doing first take, doing Sports Center, doing all that stuff. Even when I go to the games, because the celebrity portion of it is elevated so exponentially, what happens now is all right. I got to get to games early. I got to leave early because 
If I don't, it's a mob scene when I get mm. out for pictures, You're autographs. You're a rock star now. And, and not only that, they Look want you. they want people's pictures and autographs. Me, they want to debate. So it's always something. Yeah, everyone and, thinks and, and, they, and, they know and you. And so you're going through all of that. Now that's changed. And because of that, I can't be the reporter that I used to be because I could be on the scene. I didn't have to worry about it. Now I got to rely on context, inside info, all of that stuff. And but is you, for that are way. you out of touch? Did I just hear you say I'm Steve? To, compared to what I used to be, hell yeah. By the way, don't get me wrong. I got the Rolodex. Everybody comes in. They call, all of that stuff. If I... I I would, the difference is is that I can pick up the phone and within a matter of a couple of hours find out anything I want to know. Back in the day, I didn't have to. I was there. It was I was there. Right. So it didn't have to be that two hour gap or anything. That's the difference. It's not that I don't have the information. I even get even more information now because everybody see the platform that I have. The difference is I don't have to chase those stories. But because I don't have to chase those stories, ESPN says, well, that means you don't have to be on the scene 250 days out of the year. Now you can be on the scene 175 <laughs> days out of the year because we need you in this studio. Right. And that's the difference. Isn't it? Isn't it weird, though, that by the time you make it to the level where you're at, where you're killing it, you're you have to rely more on the personality of Stephen A. Smith yeah, yeah. as opposed to had you gotten this opportunity 20 years ago and all, and now everyone comes for you. Every time you say anything, That's right. everyone is waiting to tear you down. That's true. Whereas 20 years ago, you knew more than every single person on Twitter right. trying to, well, it wasn't Twitter, but that right. would have existed at that time. But the difference, the thing is, is that they come after me now, but I'm just giving an opinion. It's usually an informed opinion, but I'm giving an opinion because I didn't pick up the phone. I don't have time to pick up the phone on every single subject and be like, all right, what's going on here? Give me the inside on everything. Because some things are just not that important. You know, you're looking at it and 70, 75% of the time, okay, it's all right to just give this opinion about this because it ain't make or break it. It ain't breaking news. It's not that important. You don't need to. Where back in the day, I was reporting and it was my job to provide the information that other people were pontificating about. So you got that going on and it is what it is but the the biggest thing is the celebrity i can't the days of me just going anywhere and having a do private you like life it? that is over do you like hell it? no you don't like hell it. no but i i do get paid lovely for it that does matter and the quality of life that i have now compared to what i had back I in the you. day more than makes up i saw you magic celebrity. johnson's 60th birthday yo, yo, party at some private yo, yo, island shaka bro. khan singing bro. stephen a <laughs> <Two> <laughs> step and cedric the entertainer in the i saw right that now. i saw that it that was is the greatest that is the greatest vacation I've ever had in my <laughs> life. I'm one of those dudes. I'm from, you know, my family's from the West Indies and all of that stuff from St. Thomas and all of that. And even though I was born and raised in New York. Here's the thing. I'm a New Yorker, born and raised. This is I don't give a damn where I go, I want to get back. You, 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 can give, you can put me to Barbados, you can put me to West Indies, you can put me anywhere. Give me about three, four days, I want to get back. I did not want to come back. Where was this? Was Spain? This was Sandro Pat. Sandro Pat. Yeah. Man, it, Lord have mercy. This I, is I mean, money on another level. It, it, it was it was something special. Magic Johnson did it up. We rolled out there. He had a he had a, a, a ship the size damn near the size of a cruise ship. Okay, second day. He rented Nikki Beach, the beach, yeah, the, the entire thing. beach. You know, you got them nice cushion seat lounge chairs, all this. This brother had enough to seat two hundred and fifty people. Pool party inside. I mean, everybody. Y'all saw whoever's there. Yeah, I ain't gonna what say what happens in San Jose. Stays in San Jose. <laughs> but you know what I'm saying. Everybody was there. And I mean, it, it, the third night it was a party at, 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 the, at, at this fabulous hotel. I'm just sitting there, and I had to leave a day early and miss the best party. Right. Oh, damn. It's the best party. I was like, I just looked at Magic. I was like, damn. Damn. You know, no matter how how much you think you've made it, yeah. there's certain environments where you just go like that. Yeah, I, I don't have it like this. Now, speaking <laughs> no. of Magic Johnson, yeah. let's let's talk about Magic sure. Johnson and the Lakers. Yeah, yeah. Um, what is your opinion of what's taking place with the Lakers right now? I love it. I think I got the Lakers as my favorites to win it all, even with the cancer, Dwight Howard. Well, you could look at it that way, but I think he's been incredibly humbled. Okay. Um, because listen, he's on a two point six million dollar one year non-guaranteed deal. Ooh. He passed gas, they can let him go. Wow. Okay? That's it, 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 This is it. He don't do it this time. It's his, his career is a wrap. And I think that everybody knows, it's like, like without getting in this personal business, because I don't do that, if you know his personal business, you realize that a lot of the troubles that he causes 
is because he deals with a lot personally. Mm -hmm. It's not about, like, professionally, he ain't some bad teammate that's trying to knock people down and, and do shady nonsense okay. or whatever. All right. He's it, It's more childish because you put yourself in a situation as a man, but you ain't handling it as a man sometimes. Right. Sometimes the boyishness comes out and you're a little bit pouty and stuff like that. And grown men that's, that, that, that's got bills to pay, that's handling their business, got this money to make, they ain't got time for all of that. They're like, you put yourself in this in this situation. You got to handle it. They're sympathetic to it, but in the same breath, don't bring mm. it to work to the point where it affects your level of play. And you start thinking you need to be more than you actually are. The White Howard was an all-star and an all-world player as a defender, shot blocker, and rebounder. Do that. Don't go out there acting like you can shoot jump shots, that you the second coming to Kareem, no. that you can average 25 a game no. offensively. That's not who you are. We've seen LeBron pout in some situations and get frustrated. Yeah. We've seen this. Yeah. Those two together. Well, there, I mean, it's there's no two together. It's LeBron because the White Howard don't matter. This is not the White Howard in Orlando. You have no say. In mm. L.A., especially since that's a place that you left on your own volition to go join the Houston Rockets. Mm. You have no cachet in and L.A. And you think he's okay he's like, with that? As I, he goes and check and he's, he's I think, ready? I, I think he's trying to survive. I he think has he's no trying room. to survive and resurrect. Okay. He, he yeah. ended up there because he was stuck there. He had no choice. Remember, originally it wasn't supposed to be him. DeMarcus Cousins goes down, and that's the only reason why Dwight Howard ended up in L.A. And so when you look at it from that perspective, it's about the uh, LeBron. It's about Anthony Davis. It's about Kyle Kuzma and the other parts that they put around him. Dwight Howard is the least valuable player to the Los Angeles Lakers in terms of, you know, personality and stuff. They don't have to tolerate nothing. They're doing him a favor. He knows it, and now he has to make the most of it. They've given him a last chance. And, oh, by the way, in order to sign him, I was told that at least four or five players met with him privately before the Lakers agreed to do it, and the Lakers actually allowed the players to make the decision as to whether or not he would be brought on the Lakers. The Lakers didn't make this call. They allowed the five players to do so. So, and the reason I tie that to Magic Johnson, he stepped away from his yeah. front office duties. Yeah. Um, I suspected when it happened that he was playing possum. He's still around there with the L.A. Sparks. He yeah. knows the family. Well, he's always he's probably waiting for some things to play he's out. A, he's, L, he's L.A. He's L.A. But he got tired of the nonsense. Rob Palenka, the general manager uh, for the Los Angeles Lakers, was talking – uh, to, about Magic behind his back yeah, yeah. as far as Magic Johnson was concerned. We had all heard that, but Magic Johnson firmly believed it. Um, and just the chirping and the talking, like, you know, little things, like walking into the practice facility, where's Magic, where's Magic? And it was like a joke to highlight the fact that, once again, Magic wasn't here. Magic was at his office. And Magic's whole deal was that, listen, I'm an overseer. You go pound that pavement, I'll make those decisions when it's time to make those decisions. I'm running a $600, billion, a $600 million business. I'm divesting my interest to some or my association to some degree. I'm leaving those obligations to other people. I'll be around enough. You can get me on the phone, but in the end, what I need you to do, I'm not going to be working the phones like that, and he shouldn't. I think the only mistake Magic made is when he first took the job, he said he was going to be all in. And when he departed from the job, he was like, I'm an overseer. So there's some inconsistency with his verbiage there. But I always knew what Magic was going to do. Magic ain't going to be on the phone calling co uh, general managers. I just managers think he's waiting for Palenka to fail. And then he's going to swoop back no, in. That's all, right, all right, I'm jumping no. in, Ebro. You've made this Lakers radio for way too long. Let's. We, right. we got to ask. We gotta I'm ask. a Laker fan, No, man. I know. I know. There's but the, a lot to cover. There's a lot to cover. The audience wants to know about the Knicks. I think we should give the we audience. We got time? I think the audience wants the opportunity to fight with Stephen I will, A. Themselves. I will say this. I will say this. Ebro's kind of right from the standpoint that, you know what, I got time. But I don't think people want to hear about the Knicks. <laughs> I don't think people want to hear about the Knicks. I think, I, think, I think that we need to be honest about that. Uh, when you miss out on KD and Kyrie, here's the thing. The Knicks are actually going to be better because some of the parts that they got, definitely, and they didn't strap themselves to any bad long-term contracts. So there's still the prospects of, of a decent future. But make no mistake about it, the Brooklyn Nets were a playoff team without these brothers. Kyrie... I'm really getting tired of people not realizing who the hell Kyrie Irving is. You do walk through the turnstiles to see that brother. This ain't some Tim Duncan type where it's like, yo, he's a Hall of Fame, he's great, he's a champion. Big fundamentals. He's gonna put big fundamentals. No, no, no. 
Kyrie, you know, you walk through the turnstiles to see the Spurs because that's all they have in San Antonio is the Spurs. And obviously, Tim Duncan is the greatest power forward to ever live, but the bottom line is he won box office per se. Absolute winner, but not box office. Kyrie is box office. Agreed. He is a show stopper. You walk through the turnstiles to watch this brother dance. And if the brother was doing it in Cleveland, and he was doing it in Boston, this brother from New Jersey, you imagine what he's going to do at the Barclays Center? Oh, Kyrie ready to put on the show, and he will. And then you got KD, who I just did the boardroom with his show, the boardroom on ESPN Plus with that. our guy Rich Kleiman. Yeah, yep. we we did we taped it Friday. It comes. I don't know when it's coming out soon, but you don't want to miss that. It's me and, and KD one on one. So it was like with Jay Williams moderating, you know. And so you don't want to miss that. But KD, look, this notion that he's just gonna miss the whole season next year, technology has advanced. KD ain't gonna be a hundred percent, but he's KD. Does he really need to be 100% to mm. drop 25 a night? You know who this brother is? This brother's a career 27-point But let's be scorer. careful. The reason we're in this situation is because he knew he had an injury. He and tried, he's not going to rush. He's not going to rush. He, he tried to get he, out there too soon well, and do it for his well, team. Well, well, I ain't going to lie to you. I would have done the same thing if I were him. Now, some people say that's crazy or whatever. But like I told y'all, there's no basketball. Let me tell you something. If I were the executive of the New York Knicks or any NBA team and KD – had torn his Achilles, I'd still walk up to him and give him the max. There was no jeopardy jeopardizing his money. This brother's all world. He's a career 27-point-per-game scorer, 49% shooting from the field, 38% shooting from three-point range, one of the most efficient offensive juggernauts the game of basketball has ever seen. And that's what I think people are missing. If LeBron were to go down, if Russell Westbrook were to go down, entirely different effect because their athleticism and their overall physicality contributes mightily to their greatness. Kevin Durant is 6'11", with a 7'6 wingspan who's a sniper. So Shoots even if so even so even if he's not yeah. even if he's not 100%. It was never people don't understand. Right. People don't understand that you what are you going to do when he's pulling up from 3? You ain't going to block it. You ain't going to block it. You know what I'm saying? So to, to think that he has to be 100%. You got Kyrie K, slashing and dashing if K, dishing if KD from three. if KD can run up and down the floor and be 70%, KD can average 23 a night. It's that easy for him. And that's what people are missing. Uh, can you talk about, give us some info on HBCU Week? Well, HBCU Week, I'm the ambassador for HBCU Week. It was started three years ago. Um, you know, our co-founders, Earl Cooper and Ashley Christopher, they both work for the mayor's office of, of Wilmington, Delaware, Mayor uh, Persecki. Uh, when I went there, they were honoring me a few months ago. John Carney, the governor, was there. Two U.S. senators were there and what have you. And they really made a big deal about HBCU Week. They felt like when you consider some of the things that go on, particularly within the inner city community and those from impoverished backgrounds looking for an opportunity to get an education, it simply wasn't there. And the history of HBCUs obviously focused on making sure those folks had those kind of opportunities. So they started something called HBCU Week where you have a fair, uh, colleges getting involved and things of that nature. But they were looking for somebody to, you know, really, really bring attention to it and pump it up. And so they asked for me to be the ambassador for HBCU Week. I am a graduate of an HBCU. Where'd you go? Winston-Salem State University in North yeah. Carolina. I played basketball for Clarence, the legendary Clarence Big House games. Or at least I tried to play for Crown Out Loud. And then what happened is, is that, you know, when I when they brought it to my attention, well, I realized, okay, it's an opportunity to bring attention to HBCUs. It's an opportunity to help folks from uh, disenfranchised communities, which obviously I come from, being from Hollis, Queens, and all of that stuff. And, and Queens. Just, the Queens. In the building. And then after that, um, also going to have a college fair. And so that day, that Friday, September 20th, uh, this Friday, we're going to have a college fair that day as well. We're bringing First Take, ESPN's first, my show, First oh, Take. Tight. We're bringing it live to Delaware State. We got over 24, 25 colleges from H HBCUs that are going to participate. There's going to be a battle of the bands this weekend. Ooh, Not only that, any high school student, any high school senior that shows up with their grades, and the SAT or ACT score could get a scholarship on the spot and obviously get enrolled oh, wow. to college as well. And so for, for me, it's an opportunity 
to just give back. That's one of the things that I had always promised, you know, Coach Gaines. That's all he ever asked of me. He said, damn it, boy, you were injured from the time you walked through this door. You never could play. He said, I don't give a damn how good you can play, how good you can shoot. It didn't matter because you were injured from day one when you walked through the door. He said, but you're smart as hell and you're ambitious. Just promise me you'll give back. And I always promised him, you know, that I would give back. So I dedicated a quarter of a million dollars myself to my alma mater. I plan on dedicating more in the future and and you know just generate an interest magic johnson is going to show up he will be there because he's a vendor for some of the hbcus so he will be in attendance troy vincent the executive vp for the nfl he's going to be in, t- in attendance because the nfl has been doing some things with the uh, hbcus as well in terms of creating businesses for them and what have you just to generate revenue and things of that nature so all of this falls in line with helping kids get a college education, getting them in school, understanding the value of an education, and really, really going for it. Because I don't give a damn who you are. You always need some sort of education. And it's not that everybody needs a college education to succeed, obviously, but it certainly gives you a leg up. And more importantly, the more you have, the more you value. And the more you value, the better the decisions there is that you make. You could go to uh, hbcuweek.org. They say 4,000 students are expected to show up, and they're giving out over $2 million in on-site Scholarship. What a That's a great amazing. opportunity. Yeah. So, How do you answer when someone says to you, if you see them this week and they go, yo, Stephen A., what's the real HU? What's your answer for which is the real HU? Mm, it's crucial. It's crucial. This is a very hard answer. Choose I've worked on it my whole life. Wisely. Which, uh, I wouldn't know the answer to that question. I'm going to pick <laughs> my alma mater. Go. You say Winston Salem. <laughs> I'm going to pick my alma mater. <laughs> but, I will, but I will say a, A&T was lovely. Hampton is nice. Howard is no joke. Morehouse is Morehouse. Spellman is Spellman. I mean, come on now. There's a there's a whole bunch, but I'm going to always go with my alma mater first. So did so you if- read Jamel Hill's article yes. about uh, black student athletes yes. uh, taking their talents yes. to HBCUs to help economically? Mm-hmm. Uh, and and what did you feel about it? First of all, I thought she was absolutely on point in terms of what she was saying. She wasn't wrong about a damn thing she said. It's just unrealistic. You know, I deal in a, I deal with, uh, in a realistic world. I don't, I don't engage in too much idealism uh, because I think that you're usually standing alone when that happens. Mm-hmm. Let's take this into account. You're talking about marquee athletes. Let's say, for example, you have four or five black, a uh, 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 version of the Fab Five that decides to go to an HBCU. Of course, that would have a profound impact. Make no mistake about it. But when you look at the money that's poured into these big institutions, we're a little bit late to the party in terms of thinking like something like that is going to have residual impact and work, you know, extremely well for over the long term. It might be an immediate fix. You might get somebody on TV once or twice, but you ain't going to see an HBCU on national television at the expense of the SEC, the ACC, the Big East, the Pac-12, all that. You the ain't fan base that. of those things exactly. are too large. It's, it's too large, the big five conferences and what have you. The money that's poured in, put into perspective where you have one school, for example, that might have generated an excess of, of $100 million in revenue, and you have an entire HBCU conference, for example, that might have made $18 million in profit. Right. That's the kind of discrepancy that you're talking about here. So she's not wrong with what she's saying. She's not wrong about the potential impact that it could have, the kind of message it would send, how it could generate interest. But do I see that happening? I don't see young kids, particularly from impoverished backgrounds, that are going to make that sacrifice when they're trying to get to that point themselves. Trying they're to get just the not going right They're now. not going to be altruistic in that regard. So I don't think that's, I don't think that's what's going to happen. But I do think there are ways to address her concerns. Like, for example, if you are the MB, NBA players. How about insisting that you have exhibition games at HBCUs? Why don't you insist that All-Star Weekend be at an HBCU Mm. instead of one of these NBA arenas? Why don't you do that? Why don't you have preseason games at this? Why don't you insist with teams that you pound the pavement in HBCUs to peel talents from those particular places to bring into the NBA. And as a result, you also facilitate those guys being in position to give back to HBCUs and give attention. ESPN has blessed me with the opportunity where I'm able to do what I do, and I obviously make a little paper. If I wasn't making that paper, I couldn't have dedicated a quarter of a million dollars to my alma mater. But because I'm making a little paper, I was able to do that. If I make more, I'm going to give more. If you have athletes that are making more, they're going to give more. Not only that, I'm on the air talking to you, and I'm not even talking to you about my HBCU. I'm talking to you about HBCUs, okay? So just imagine what they would be able to do 
if you put them in position to do those things. Because everybody's not going to be able to go to North Carolina or Duke or anything like that. But I got news for you. Everybody ain't going to want to. Because the personal experience that I had as a student at an HBCU, I can't say enough about what it did for my life. The, you know, the friends that I have, people like yourself and others, excuse me, I had friends like that in college. And when you are surrounded by folks from a similar culture, similar sacrifices, similar plights, trials and tribulations, it's a family. And each one uplifts the other. Mm -hmm. And that propels you to different heights, as opposed to you being a lone ranger at a white institution where you're surrounded by a bunch of people that don't necessarily relate to you, your plight, your struggles, et cetera, et cetera. And sometimes, more often than not, you find yourself standing alone. That's the challenges that black folks go through that we don't articulate enough about, mm -hmm. where it's that challenge, that uphill climb. When you got a brotherhood, a sisterhood, a familyhood going on, it propels you to another level. That's ultimately what has sustained us since the days of slavery. We had each other. That's right. You see what I'm saying? But along the way, that gets lost in the shuffle, and you find yourself more, more often than not completely alone, scratching and clawing your way to the top all by your lonesome. And that's why sometimes the challenge seems a bit daunting. And HBCUs can help resolve that because you could be surrounded by loved ones who now, got your back. Now, the California law that LeBron is helping push, and um, yeah. it looks like it's going through. It's just waiting for the governor's signature right now. Well, the now. governor, yeah, the Senate, uh, the, the, the uh, Senate in uh, California, this California state uh, voted 39 to 0. Um, the state assembly uh, voted 73 to 0. So it's in Gavin Newsom, the, the governor for California, is expected to sign in a law where collegiate athletes will have the right to profit off of their own image. An agent. They can they can market themselves, you know, or they can make money off of marketing dollars, not necessarily receiving salaries from the institutions, but you can position yourself where you can get some of the money that you can generate as an individual. They can't get in the way of that any longer in the state of California. Once he signs that into law in other states, it's expected that other states will pick it up. The NCAA is doing everything in its power block. to block it and to fight it because they think it's a Severely compromises amateurism, and they don't want that. But I don't want to hear that. The NCAA, coaches making millions of dollars from sneakers company and beyond. Everybody surrounding these athletes. These coaches are state money. employees sometimes. The highest sometimes. paid. Nick Saban they're, they're is sometimes. the highest that's paid right. state employee. Right. Yeah, yeah, but I never, that's I'm never crazy. phased by that because what was Alabama before he arrived? No, I'm not I, saying he, he should deserved. be faulted he deserved, for it. He deserved I'm it. just saying the in players the context. Should get a piece. In the context, they're using taxpayer revenue and as well as ticket revenue, as well as well, endorsement but, revenue, but, and these other things to pay these people. But I think I think that when people say that you're right, you're not wrong. But I think there's a far more simplistic way to address the NCAA. For sure. And here it is. And here it is. Everybody at the dinner table, and you the only one ain't eating. That ain't a problem. If you if you sitting there stuffing your face and being gluttonous with your stuff. And it's a table full of us. And I'm the only one ain't, that ain't eating. But I'm the only one on the court balling. Or on the field balling. We have a problem. Yes. And that's what the NCAA, nobody has basically broken down to the NCAA. And if you weren't so gluttonous as the NCAA, if you didn't go out of your way to profit at every turn, okay? Well said, yeah. Then excuse me, maybe those athletes wouldn't have had a problem. The problem is you made sure to get yours. Coaches made sure to get theirs. University presidents, you know, provost, administrators, everybody got paid on the backs of the athletes, but then you're telling the athlete they can't have. That's that, that's un-American. That's not. I was going to say it's un-American. It's un-American, it's, it's un -American. and yes. that's and that's really what this all comes down to. And nobody has really broken it down to them in that simplistic term. And not only that, one of the things that I'm a stickler for, and I just got to say this, I, I'm I'm going to lose my mind if I keep if I keep hearing po folks talk about equality. I don't give a damn whether it's Title IX. I don't give a damn if it's male sports and volleyball, wrestling. You are not a revenue generator. Whoever's a revenue generator deserves money. Whoever's not a ge revenue generator, be happy with that damn scholarship and call it a day. That's right. You know, if you are playing volleyball or wrestling or you are playing, you know, I don't know what it is because women's college basketball is pretty damn good. That's right. Yes. Women's tennis on a pro level, of course, that's pretty good. But I get upset when folks, particularly, like, for example, you have some folks in the WNBA, they might sit up there and say, well, we deserve X, Y, Z. 
Well, okay, just as long as you don't say that you deserve as much as NBA players. Because you don't generate the revenue it's that NBA money. players do. Last time I checked, women outnumber men in this world, okay? There's a whole bunch of women in this world. You have the license to support these female sports if you want to. And if you were supporting that sport, they would be generating more money. And as a result of generating more money, you'd get more money. Money has to go to where the revenue is. Well, the conversation around fair and it's not, also, and it, and it's also not just women; it's the male the sports, wrestling, yeah, Bible, all, all of, of that stuff. But mm-hmm. people, but people, when it comes to the NCAA conversation, specifically around basketball and football, start talking about fair, right. and and people are on the team and who gets what, and if they don't play, well, if you ain't bring, like you said, if you're not generating revenue, right. if you're not helping put points on the board, if you're not on the right. field a certain right. amount of time, so, you're not going to make and, the same and, amount of money and, as somebody and, who has not and, seen playing that's time. That's exactly correct. And here's the deal: if you play football. Football at Alabama. Do you deserve the same if you had Drexel? No. <laughs> it's, it's, it's just no. You it don't. Work, and it could okay? work that way across the board. Listen, and listen, it's a great it, life it, lesson, it, too. It, it, I think if we're going to start raising human beings to be ready for right. adult life, they should learn it. That's what it's, college that, is that, for. That, well, not just college. It's America. It's That's the nation that you're living in. I work for ESPN. Look, man, I don't work on local television. I don't expect to make local television money. Period. I ain't apologizing for it. I didn't bust my tail to get to this point to sit up there and say, I want everybody equal. Everybody don't put in my work and everybody don't produce how I produce. So they don't deserve what I deserve. And I don't deserve what other cats don't deserve. I mean, in the world of sports, I don't think that's the case with anybody right now. But the point that I'm making is (laughs) you're number one. You're you're saying you're the overall number one sports talent right now. I am. I mean, I'm not apologizing for it. I, I don't. That's no disrespect to my colleagues or anything like that. But I, I, I'm giving fact when you point out revenue and ratings. We are a polarizing I, I, figure. Well, You're engaging. First, first take is number one from 10 a.m. to noon in all of television, not just cable, all of television. Period. That's the way it goes. Excuse me. What makes you number one? They say ratings. They say. Revenue generated from ratings. Well, that would make us number one. Where's my money? You're damn right. I'm not apologizing for that. <laughs> I, I mean, I don't, I'm not. I'm, I'm, I'm not apologizing for that. I don't. And I don't. I don't think. I don't think any. Listen. At the end of the day, I don't. Listen. I, it's not gonna last forever. Someday everybody falls. Somebody else climbs. Bring but up the, the bottom, Tim but, clip. But, but the bottom line is, is that while you're there, you have a right to sit up there and say. Excuse me, this is what I'm worth. And absolutely. And Period. I, I think the company's made it very clear over the last couple of years from the places they position you, yeah. that they see your value, yeah. not just on first take, because yeah. they don't want you to live just in the middle of the day. That's right. When there's big events going on, you see Stephen A. there at night. I'm so working can you from make 7 this... in the morning to 1 in the morning sometimes. Can you make stuff like this, this BS stop, though? Can you make this stop? When I was at the University of Florida, I think my jersey was one of the top-selling jerseys around the world. Uh, it was like Kobe, LeBron, and then I was right behind them, and I didn't make a dollar from it. But nor did I want to, because I knew going into college what, 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 it, um, what it was all about. I knew going to Florida, my dream school, where I wanted to go, the passion for it. And if I could support my team, support my college, support my university, that's what it's all about. But now we're changing it from us, from we, from my university, from being an alumni night where I care which makes college football and college sports special to then okay it's not about us it's not about we it's just about me and yes I know we live in a selfish culture where it's all about us but we're just adding and piling it onto that mm. where it changes right, enough, what's special enough about- enough mm. I can't take it what were you well, thinking? I can't take well it. you should take it let me tell you why first of all I don't I don't agree with Tim Tebow on that position at all which he knows I completely support his right to say what he said. Of course. And see, and and this is where people get confused. He was not clueless. It's not like he says something that's false. He was saying the money don't matter to me. That's right. Because that's his that, life. That, 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 that's his life. This dude is on missionaries, you know what I'm saying, and, and traveling all over the world, giving to the needy. The Bible states, you know, what, what, what is it? That, what good is a man who profits the whole world but loses his own soul? Many people throughout the years, have deferred to that biblical verse. Here's a guy that practices it, and we holding it against him. Now, that ain't me. Oh, I'm not mad but, at no, him. I'm not talking about you, but I'm saying a lot of people would, I mean, listen, 8 million people attacked him on Twitter this week. 8 million people, okay? And I'm saying to you, wait a minute. We say that stuff all the time. This is a brother who lives it. 
He he wasn't born in the privilege. He didn't have a life of privilege. He's telling you he don't care. I, I find that opinion to be legitimate. In other words, if he was sitting up there, then, you know, he was living the life that would be different. But he made a very valid point. I was a Heisman Trophy winner and a national champion. And I had the number one selling jersey in all of college football. I didn't make a dime and I didn't care. Now, that ain't me. That ain't you. That no. damn sure ain't you. <laughs> but guess what? That is him. It's consistent this is not about, with who he's right, been. But, th- but so, my problem with what he's saying right. is not that he's saying it. Okay. My problem with what he's saying is it puts out, like, I don't know, a cloud over individuals in a capitalist society That's fair. who are going after what is rightfully theirs, which is what I compensation right. based on making other yeah. people money. Let me right. tell you what I told him. I said to him, please understand that I respect where you're coming from. Here's why I disagree. Obviously, you ain't a brother, and you have not been in a situation where, you know, you're a black man, you come from a disenfranchised community, you feel like this is your shot to make it because you ain't necessarily beloved, and the world ain't gravitating to you and throwing opportunities in your face where you can afford to wait you're not, they're not that dude. Not only that, so you took a knee and kept your job. Right, right. You was kneeling during the national anthem and kept your job. Right. You're still, and nobody had a problem when you was doing yeah, it because you never, was praying. I, I never thought about it. That's you, a good one. I never thought about that. Because you was praying. Even though that was and the political, world, he was praying, but that was a but political. Still, but still, nonetheless, but right. nonetheless, everybody was fine with what you was doing. Right. You know what I mean? And well, if well, it would have been someone else. Well, no, I don't know if that's the way to say it. And he has been torn down. Let's be clear. Yeah, yeah. Tim Tebow's been given a ton of opportunities. He's also been torn down quite a bit as well. He was attacked. He was attacked. He was attacked. He was attacked. And by the way, if he was kneeling at the time, but he was a Muslim instead of a Christian, who's to say what kind of backlash oh, he would have so received? So, 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 so there right, we go. Right, so, right. so 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 clearly it was a, you know the reason why that it wasn't but so much backlash is because his religion is what America pretty much predominantly identifies itself with. But in the end, what it comes down to getting back to him is that he understood my point that you have to understand right. that folks that black folks are going to have a different attitude because they don't trust and have faith in the system the way that you do, and they don't feel that the system is going to gravitate towards giving it an opportunity the way it gave you an opportunity. Mm-hmm. And he completely understood that. He completely understood it. But he was coming from a relatively pure perspective as a white dude who gave, continues to give, and sacrifice and what have you, who doesn't prioritize money over the amateur experience. I respect it, even though I don't agree so with it. So Ebro mentioned uh, kneeling. So I think it's a good time to transition to Colin Kaepernick. Yep. You have had a, you have been critical yep. of our sister up here, Nessa, before on your show. Mm-hmm. Um, you've been critical of Colin, although you've also been supportive of him. Yes, right. I know you ran into Nessa last week. Yep. Where do things stand with well, the relationship Well, first of all, let me say this. Um, the young brother, I, I, I apologize for forgetting his name, but it's a young brother that works with her. That was waiting outside. It was Carl Ferguson, I, I believe, so, our yeah, photographer. Yes. You know, thick, you know, yes, l- 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 yes. l- 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 like he rated yeah. body slams. He looks like security, but he's really a photographer. He's one of the nicest you know, guys. Nicest guy. One of the yeah. nicest guys in the world. And I can't say enough about how classy he was in approaching me and letting me know, look, man, we got a problem with you. We really didn't like X, Y, and Z. And I had to correct him on a couple of things saying, I didn't say that. I said the NFL said that. Because that's where my report back. I'm like, I'm talking to owners. I'm talking to officials in the NFL Players Association. I'm telling you what they said. Now, you might have seen me one time just come out of my mouth and say something, but it might have been after I echoed the fact that I got it from the NFL and the Players Association 15 different times. Damn, I got to regurgitate the same sentence every time? I'm not going to do that. But in the process of us talking, he was like, well, you said something about our sister Nessa, and she's right there. And she was sitting right in the studio. Mm-hmm. Wait, hoping that I came in and so I came in there and I spoke to her and she was making the case about what she felt I was wrong about Colin Kaepernick I brought up Miami, Baltimore, Seattle, Denver she said he had never been offered those jobs I said well you got a problem because that's what they're saying they're saying they did offer him a job they were giving him the opportunity but he was hell bent on maintaining his position and they didn't want in terms of kneeling and stuff like that and they didn't want to deal with that so we had a very healthy discussion she was incredibly classy and very respectful What I would say and what I had to correct them on is I've never felt like I attacked her. What I did was say, look, you go put out a tweet and you're comparing the owner of the Baltimore Ravens along with Ray Lewis, a Hall of Fame linebacker that played for him, and you're comparing them to the characters in Django. 
Samuel L. Jackson and Leonardo DiCaprio's characters in Django, that don't help. You see what I'm saying? It doesn't matter how right you are in whatever you elect to do. In this particular situation, the president got involved. He hijacked the narrative because it, for his own yep. political right, gain. Right. We know he did all of that, okay? So with all of that going on, now it's not about right and wrong. It's about the fight that you're fighting and whether or not you're focused on winning. How do you get what you want? The objective was to bring attention to racial oppression, racial inequality, brutality on the part of police officers. Well, you succeeded. You had the players coalition that got involved. You got the NFL owners that got involved. You got the public, millions upon millions of people that standing behind you. We know you're a bad brother. We saw what you could do, et cetera, et cetera. All of these things happened. So you succeeded in bringing attention, which you said was your goal. Now that you've done that, what about football? Because what they're saying is we don't want that now. And why? I had to explain this a couple of times to folks. You have NFL owners that were complaining about the notion, no proof whatsoever, but the notion that Colin Kaepernick was going to cost them money, okay? This is after each one of them got a check for $226 million from the revenue generated by their television deal. $226 million. You know this. Per, per owner. Per owner. Yes. They got the check and was still complaining about the potential for what Colin Kaepernick could cost them. So it shows you where their mindset is. Why am I bringing that up? Remember that whole gambling stuff that was taking place, how the NFL was going to get involved in it because states were going to, it was gambling, was gonna, sports gambling was going to be legalized in mm -hmm. certain states, right? Mm -hmm. Remember all that whole ordeal? Mm -hmm. Well, what was going on on Capitol Hill is that the owners, the NFL owners were trying to get involved with that, where they were trying to get a percentage of, you know, the bets and all of this other stuff that was going on. Uh, forgive me, I don't have all this information. over and above there. fantasy. Right, over and above fantasy. So what happens is we're talking billions. Well, guess what? In order for that to happen, you need Congress to sign off on it, and you need the president to sign off on it. What you don't need is the president turning his attention towards you and going against you just because he don't like you. He wanted to own the Buffalo Bills. Mad, you right? wouldn't let He's him in. Mad. He's still mad about you. Yeah. He's looking to get at you. They didn't want to agitate it. So what happened is, is that they couldn't side with Colin Kaepernick and stand firm with him unless they were willing to cost themselves billions. And you're asking owners who ain't willing to cost themselves pennies to cost themselves billions. This is what I'm talking about in terms of practicality. Let's get away from the idealism and deal with the realism. Right. They're not going to do that, ladies and gentlemen. And not only that, we know that Colin Kaepernick was right. Well, and I think, and I think part of, of a lot of people's frustration is either their lack of understanding right. of all of that mm -hmm. detail, yep. um, which is most of it, mm -hmm. as well as accepting that people can be that greedy, that nasty. Well, and you know what I mean? That you, people that, have that a hard too, time. That, that too. But, but, but my response to that is I don't understand that. And the reason why I don't understand that is because America has always been greedy. And America nasty. has always been gluttonous. And what we have is a situation where you have 32 owners who are white billionaires and folks are walking around confused as to why they don't empathize and comprehend the black plight. I don't know too many white billionaires that understand the black plight. I don't know too many white billionaires that are interested in the black plight. I do know that if you have an agenda, it's incumbent upon you to manipulate situations and circumstances in a manner where you show them that their willingness to address to address your issues zealously benefits their agenda. That's the only way to get them to really side and vibe with you. You think that's what Jay Z's doing here? I think that's. I think that ultimately is what he's going to try to do. Now, is it going to be something in it for him? I have no doubt. Of course, that's going to be the case. But at the end of the day. If this is a brother from Brooklyn who established himself as a hip-hop mogul and an iconic figure who never shied away from his own blackness and his rise to the top. My argument on behalf of Jay-Z was not that he did everything right, not that that press conference was a good look, because no, it wasn't. said the same it thing. It wasn't. Yeah. My point is, give the man a chance to yeah, see what he does. To thing. sit up there and call him a sellout, to question his blackness, this is the problem that we have in our community. The second something happens and we don't agree with what something one of us is doing, we get engaged in character assassination as opposed to sticking to that particular issue and saying, look, 
I'm not feeling that. Explain that to me. Or do what most people do with me. Yo, Stephen A., make sure you do this. Stephen A., don't let us down. Make sure you touch. I'm a sports guy. They had me talking Trayvon Martin. They had me talking Eric Garner. They had me talking a lot of that stuff. Why? Because I'm one of the few black voices out there in position to do so. I understood that. So coming to me and saying to me, Stephen A., make sure. Please make sure you touch on this. Stephen A., bring attention to this. I respect that. To sit up there, but if you come at me and go like this, yo, man, if you don't touch on this, you a damn sellout. I'm going to tell you, kiss my ass. Because you don't know me. So why mm-hmm. would you come to me off the bat with that kind and of I attitude? Felt, I felt your frustration when I heard you on the air talking about you couldn't believe. I felt the exact same way. Right. You couldn't believe that after this long, one press conference, that's and right. people would turn on Jay-Z yeah, in one just second. Just one. Just one. And, and, and what we don't, Guys, and what there's we, history tied to that, though. I know there's and history, there's history to it. tied to black people being let down, black underhanded things, us not understanding things as a greater community, not having access to information, mm-hmm. right, and our leaders being taken from us in a violent fashion, mm-hmm. people that we've trusted and beloved that have been taken from us in a... So there's... But it's I under, different. I don't say it's right. I'm not right. saying it's right. Right. I just understand yeah. that there's but history tied to it. But this is different. You got a microphone. I got a microphone. Right. There's too many of us that are in positions of influence where we get to disseminate a message. We got to call ourselves out on our willingness to turn our back on somebody at the drop of a dime. Well, it didn't we happen could, here. It, it didn't saying, happen You here. could disagree. That's right. You could disagree. Or you could sit up there and check somebody and be like, yo, I need you to do X, Y, and Z. That's why I love my radio show, getting back to that radio thing, because I, I take callers every day. And it's, I mean, every day, brothers and sisters call up. We got love for you, but we disagree with this. That I accept all day. That's what we're here for. If you don't think I'm right, check me on it. I'll go back and forth with you. We'll go there. But the second you use one incident to try and character assassinate me and define who I've been and who I am over the course of 51 years, you could go kick rocks. I'm not taking that. Because you don't know me like that. And you ain't doing your homework. Because Colin Kaepernick, who was trending last night, and I know you got to go, you got other work yes. to do. Colin Kaepernick was trending on Twitter last night. Jets quarterback went down, and his the backup went down. Yeah. People are like, yo, what's happening? I was on first take yesterday morning and on my radio show yesterday afternoon. I called for Colin Kaepernick to get a try immediately. The Steelers didn't even have a backup after Ben, Ro- ben Roethlisberger went down. Rudolph... Go Mason Rudolph goes in there, and they got to get somebody off the scrap heap. You saw the Jets. Sam Donald got mono. Uh, Trevor Simeon might have broken his ankle. We don't even know who you got now. Those are two teams right there that desperately need a quarterback. There is no excuse why Colin Kaepernick should not be getting a call. I will say this, though. I'm not sure if this is accurate, but I'm told that his agent has called many folks on his behalf not getting return phone calls. I don't mean to be in somebody's business like this, but you, you, you might want to rethink that agent. Because let me tell you something. There's moments like this where you got to have somebody with clout where they're going to get their phone calls returned. And, and you know, you're, able, in a, you're in a different kind of situation. And an agent that can tell the story. That's right. you know, to tell the owners the story and, of and, why and this I'm, could and work. I'm not, and I'm not advocating getting rid of because that man, you know, you riding a dime with the cat, the loyalty matters. Please don't get me wrong. What I'm saying is in our line of work, there are some agents who have more cash in than others. There are owners and executives that are not going to ignore their calls because right. they do such biz- such big business with them. It would be in their best interest. It would behoove them not to ignore those phone calls. That might be the kind of cat that you need making calls for you as opposed to somebody that ain't getting their phone calls returned because there is no excuse why Colin Kaepernick is it? Listen, he didn't violate any laws. He certainly didn't violate any NFL bylaws. And we know he can still play. According to Nesta, he works out every day. He does. Absolutely. Every, every day. day. He's on his grind the whole bit. Does he deserve an opportunity? you damn right he does. And I will make it my personal admission to repeatedly and continuously bring attention to that. And that doesn't mean I agree with every little thing that he's done. But I don't have to. You know what I'm saying? I agree with him kneeling. I agree with the cause of him kneeling. I just don't necessarily agree with the execution thereafter. But having said all of that, I completely support the brother being back in the National Football League. My only problem with Colin Kaepernick now is there's too many people talking for him. Enough of that. You are an intelligent, principled black man and proud black man. 
I appreciate Nessa. She's wonderful. Absolutely. And she could talk to me any day of the week, and I'm definitely appreciative of that. And any of his other supporters. But you know how I roll, bro. At one point in time, it's going to be like, look, man, what you hiding for? You get your ass out here. Speak. Stop leaving it for every. You want to be in the NFL? Then speak. I offered both of them, mm -hmm. along with Eric Reed. I said, I'll give you the whole two hours. Live television. Unedited. You have my word. I went up to the bosses. I said, I got that. They said, Stephen, go. Does, do you do? He got he got two hours on ESPN any morning he wants. You bring it on. Come on in there. I'm telling you, I'm gonna give you two hours to express yourself and do what you do. You want a job or not? At some point, and I, he doesn't have to come on my show. Please don't get me wrong. I'm simply saying the offer's there. The biggest thing I'm trying create to say your is own that narrative, you gotta your create story, your own it. revenue, yeah. tell your own story. His woman is wonderful. Any, I'm telling you, any man. Any man worth his salt want a woman like that. Because you want a woman to stand by. That's, that's ride and die stuff right there. She is special. No question about it. And her team is special. And they riding with Kaepernick. And you got a whole Eric Reed. I said this about Eric Reed. Who wouldn't want a friend like Eric Reed? Who wouldn't want a friend like Eric Reed? Mm -hmm. Eric Reed's a good brother. Now, I don't like how he went at Malcolm Jenkins. On, yeah, you don't like it. You felt he hijacked the, 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 the whole issue. I got it. We can debate that till the cows come home. You cannot excuse going at him on the field on a Sunday before tip-off. That's inexcusable. That's just belligerent and childish. Can't do that, okay, because you look bad. But I appreciate Eric Reed, the man that he is, and how he riding with his friend and how principled he is about look, all Look, this whole that. station riding with Kaepernick from yeah. day one. I, don't, yeah. I still don't watch football. Yeah. Still don't watch football. That's well, you. I ain't going to be guilty of that. I'm going to watch my football. <laughs> I'm going to watch my football now. But I, I'm just saying that, you know, you appreciate where they're coming from. But at the end of the day, Colin Kaepernick, has to speak up for Colin Kaepernick. Ladies and gentlemen, this is Stephen A. Smith. Uh, you can catch him on 98.7 ESPN. Every single day. One well to three right take. before the Michael K. That's show. Right. As right. well as first I'm take. I'm first take now, bro. Take care, brother. Good seeing you, Good man. seeing you. Wait, wait. Yeah, last, last question. Your favorite hip-hop record of all time. Do you have one my favorite? favorite rip, my hip favorite hip-hop record? Yeah. Ooh. Queens. Lost one. I mean, oh, I, I could go run DMC, but you but said Lauryn Hill I, I lost, lost one? one by Jay Z. Oh, by Jay Z. By Jay -Z. I, I, I love, love that record one. too. Uh, love that record. Uh, That's uh, it. It's the brother Cash right, right there, the DJ. Right. You know what I mean? Uh, this is it right here. It's not a Yo, good Stephen A. Right Smith. Here. Queens. It's hot nine seven. You brought in the morning. Thank you, man. I heard saying they may hold. They may hold. Say okay, so.